Okay, that was a fantastic case. I think a lot of great discussion came from that. We could talk about it quite a bit longer. Um, this is uh, this case will be a little bit similar in that there's a CTO involved. So I'll try to move through certain parts of this. Or again, someone made a comment about the view from our VA. That's actually our VA up on the cliff there, overlooking the San Francisco Bay. Um, and here's our case. So this patient. Uh, presented a 67-year-old male veteran with the typical risk factors. He'd had a prior cabbage in his early 50s with a lima and two veins. He had angina in 2013 <coughs> and got recathed, and it was found that the lima was patent and both veins were down. And our surgeons never take someone for a redo when there's a patent lima. So he was referred for PCI of his uh, native OM at that time which was the lower of the two hanging fruits. Um, and it was decided to treat that first and then do optimal medical therapy for the CTO of the native right, which was a total occlusion, and, and to see how he did with that. Um, where am I? So he, um, he had that PCI of his native circ in 2013 with drug eluting stents, had quite a bit of symptomatic improvement, but had persistent symptoms um, that we felt were angina. It was mostly uh, dyspnea when he exerted himself, but it was consistent with the angina. And he was referred um, by his primary cardiologist for PCI of his right coronary. Just for comparison, this is his baseline cardiogram. Our plan for the procedure was much like we talked about in the previous case. So we got bilateral femoral access. The right coronary, we planned to engage with an 8 French 90 centimeter Amplatz guide with a guide liner. Uh, the left side, we were going to engage with a six French EVU, and we were going to follow this sort of NATO algorithm, which I've kind of laid out here, and I'll walk through this as we go through the case. So we got the guides in, and we took our dual injections. And I'm just showing this one view. This is a, an RAO view. You can see the Amplatz guide in the right coronary. The left system's injected first. You see the LED is missing. There's several circ branches. You can see the stents actually in the um, circumflex before the contrast goes in. The circ is patent. Um, remember that distal LED fills from the lima. The right coronary has uh, some disease in the proximal vessel and then a kind of tapering beak, but a very long occlusion and then some reconstitution down at the PDA. So we initially went with the anti-grade wire escalation and we took a short Corsair and a series of wires. We tried a Fielder XT, initially couldn't find a microchannel, and tried with uh, Pilot 200 and a CP12 to try to penetrate and get further down. And we were not able to get all the way down to the distal true lumen, which is not surprising. We didn't really expect that we would because of the length of it. Um, this is just showing where we were with the wires. So here in this particular shot, the Corsair is in the mid-vessel, and the wire has gone out of right ventricular branch. And you can see the target that we're trying to get to in this uh, LAO and cranial view by injecting on the left side. Um, we decided that there was a poor reentry zone for ADR, mainly because uh, a lot of disease and a bifurcation down there, and that we were better off trying septal collaterals, even though they were CC0, in other words, not entirely visible through their whole course. Um, but we, you know where they're supposed to go. So we took a long Corsair and a Xion wire and went through the first septal perforator. And this is just a fluoro save of the surfing that um, they got through. So the wire kept trying to go more distally in the ventricle, and then you'll see at the end of this fluoro save, it eventually redirects a little more proximally and finds its way to the um, PDA and up to the AV groove. You have to look quickly. It's right at the end of this little save fluoro run. And here it goes, so down, down here, and then it'll find its way back up. So it's, it's now in the, in, in the Corsair track down there, so that you see in this LAO and cranial again. Now the Corsair is in the distal segment. That wire is looking a little bit um, like it might be going offline, so we're pulling back and redirecting, trying to find our way, and now you see it meets up with where the anagrid wire is. So we feel like we're initially not quite sure where that was, but um, now it, after pulling back and redirecting it, it ends up nose to nose with the anagrade wire. I might just comment, so in these sure. people that have been grafted before, the wire loves to go up the old graft. It's, it's the way that the graft sews in, so you'll see it go up real weird places 
just like that, and, and almost always, uh, you know, it'll be in, a, in an old graft, and it's kind of tricky sometimes to get it back in the native retrograde going up. Right. So we just changed our view to make sure that these look like they're nose to nose, and we've got a good path here, and we've got a loop of wire from both directions, and the loops are meeting up side by side in the subintimal space. So we're in a pretty good position, we think, to do a reverse cart. So now we've got a balloon that we brought in through the anagrade. And again, it's just a floral save. Of, we did several inflations. This is the one that's successful where we inflate, and then we try to follow the balloon with the retrograde wire as the balloon is deflating. And you see right here, we're able to follow it. It goes into the guide liner and into the guide catheter of the um, right coronary guide. So now we've got a wire all the way through the, the system. We've now advanced the Corsair. You see the tip of the Corsair is in the right coronary guide, and now we're pushing a wire all the way through, so we'll externalize the wire. And so we're now, we've had successful reverse cart, we've externalized the wire, we start ballooning, and we place three stents. Here is our um, positioning in the first stent. We wanted to put it in the distal AV segment somewhere around where we think the distal cap was. Um, that's after we've placed all three stents. We then actually did IVIS to just make sure everything was well opposed and to look at that proximal lesion. We decided that the cross-sectional area was uh, adequate. It was about five, I think, and that we wouldn't put one additional stent in the proximal vessel. And we were fairly happy with that result, actually, in this, just to show it in the RAO view. So we've got three overlapping stents. <clears throat> Again, that little bit hazy spot in the proximal right, but it looked okay on IVIS, and um, we thought we were we were pretty happy. So the patient went to recovery. And 43 minutes post-procedure, a cardiogram was obtained. Looks just like baseline. He had no complaints at that time. And then four hours and 21 minutes after the procedure at 1701, he complained of chest discomfort and had this, 50 beats of a wide complex tachycardia that self-terminated. As soon as that terminated, um, he had this cardiogram that shows, as you see, ST elevation in V1 and V2. So he was immediately brought back to the cath lab. So anybody Any in comments? the audience can take a guess as what's going on here? Uh, how about a second try? No, so potentially this is somebody that has VT after having gone through a septal. One of the things we think about all the time is potentially a septal hematoma. And they sometimes present with uh, this exact biblical scenario. I don't know if that's what so it was. So that was on our differential. The other was um, our ACT right was a. Right yeah. Sorry? Right ventricular branch can do that too. Right ventricular exactly. branch was another thing on our differential. And guide catheter thrombosis from the contralateral guide. We were a little worried because it's anterior. Maybe we took out some anterior branches from our left main guide with thrombus or something. But our ACT was okay. So to come back to the lab. First shot we took of the left, just to make sure we didn't have any problems there. You see the, the circumflex stents are fine. The LED system looks essentially the same as before. Um, you see some septals coming down. Don't see any, uh, to the point about the septal um, hematoma, we don't see sort of a wide open um, spillage of contrast into a space in the septum. So we take a picture of the right coronary, and it's patent. We're saying, huh. So we're looking at it a little more closely. Does anybody see anything? I'll put it in comparison to the prior shots in just a minute. But here's an ARIO view. Look at this one for a minute. I see a lot of pointing. Yeah. There's a contrast popping there. There's contrast. There's extravasation of contrast. Is it in one place? Is it in two places? So we counted more than 10. We stared at this. We counted more than 10 places where there was contrast coming out. And I know I didn't push things out 10 different places. So there's that whole slab of the right ventricular wall there has all the branches feeding it are spilling into a space, if you can see that, that big RV branch. Also, the course of the right coronary is much straightened compared to how it was. It had a big curve in the middle of it. I'll just put them side by side. So here's the, um, on the left, you see the image at the end of our PCI. On the right, you see the take-back image. So that curve has straightened out in the right coronary. And 
you know, even when you look back and try to find uh, any sort of extravasation, I just I challenge anyone to find it, but there's multiple points now. Um, and then we stared again at the LAO, and, and the same story. There's, um, on the previous shot on the left, there's, there's motion, there's sort of scrunching of the right coronary in systole. There's much less on the image on the right. It's sort of straightened and not moving, yet there's flow through everything, and you see all the points of extravasation, less well in this LAO view. It does look like the RV marginal may be missing as well on the current, or at least one of them. Is that right? Or? Not as prominent as you see in yeah. the pre image, right? But that's not unexpected. That's where they do the RDR. Yeah, and also when you get right precordial ST elevation, like you mentioned, so if it's V1, V2, sometimes it's an RV it's marginal. Uh, exactly. So I think that was, that was a good comment. So um, after a little time on the table, his ST elevations came from five millimeters down to this residual. His pain was getting better. His blood pressure was okay. Um, we tried to get a stat echo. There was very poor acoustic imaging, but the, I think it was a fellow trying to do this, you know, in the cath lab. Um, and there was, you know, possibly an RV hematoma. And we decided to get a CTA, a stat CTA, and see what was going on. He was more stable at that point. So this is just going to run through, if you can look, oh, can I point at this? Some people can see this already. Where's my arrow? So this arrow, I'll point to the right coronary as it comes off. It's up here. And then I'll point to the hematoma as this huge mass here. It's 9 by 6.8 by 10.5 centimeters. And this little sliver, if you can look right, right here, is the RV that's completely compressed by the... Um, by that um, hematoma. What was the risk So, um, you know, I was afraid you were going to ask that. I, I don't have it on top of my head, but we generally run the ACT with two, two catheters. We shoot for about 275 or so. At this point, we had just sort of let the heparin drift down. By the time the CTA is done, it was probably close to normal range at this point. <laughs> Pardon me? The patient at this point feels kind of uh, a little ill. He, his pain is better, though. His STs are down. His blood pressure is okay. He's, um, you know, sitting where he's in the ICU now. Okay, so we've sent him to the ICU. Just to give you another um, view of this. Pardon me? It did, and I'm sorry I don't. Ha I didn't have an image worth showing. They're really bad images, but yes, it showed compression of the right ventricle. So yes. we had a uh, is a case published in CCI last year by myself and uh, my fellow uh, Dr. Adu Somali, who's right now I think, practicing in California, where we had the same thing happen. And, uh, it was not seen on a pretty good transthoracic echo done in our holding area, and we brought him down to this CAT scanner, thinking that this was exactly what was going on, and it was a hematoma that we drained with CT guidance, and, the, and uh, it's, a, it's a CCI paper, and it was actually presented by me at a CTO summit last year as a challenging case, so you can find it on TCTMD. So I think in this case... Yeah, so the curious point to me was that the right coronary, and you can, when you scan through all the images, you can see the right coronary path lifts off of the right ventricular myocardium quite a bit. It's not contiguous with the myocardium. So that hematoma has formed in the plane under the vessel, between the muscle and the vessel, and as it's expanded, it's pulled the vessel off the heart. And the all patient's the hemodynamically stable now? And all the penetrating vessels... Are each each one keeps popping off, and those are in turn feeding the hematoma. That's how I was interpreting that. Um, he's not on pressors. He's not. He's he's, he's stable. He's a, he's got a softish pressure, but he's stable. He's he's sort of. I mean, that brings up the next dilemma. It's like, what do you do about this if he's hemodynamically stable? Do you right this or do you drain exactly. this? Exactly. So I'm going to. That was I raised that question with our interventional radiologist, who I discussed the case with, and. And it's, it's literally, if you, I was with him when he drained it, and it's like a nothing procedure under CT guidance. I mean, like, for, I was thinking it was going to be a big deal, but it's like literally two seconds. He just lays him on the table. They, they do a scout CT film. 
They take the needle, then put a 10 French thing in there, and it's done. And within five minutes, the pressure was like soft, like 75, 80. We were debating whether to give him more fluid. Started Next thing you know, his pressure is 130, and he's doing great. It's dramatic. And then, they drain? They drain. In our case, there's about 200 cc. This was a, a cardiac surgeon did this. No, a CT the guy. Inter- IR did that. IR. Interesting. With huh. CT guy, did, like interesting. Yeah. 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 And then the beauty is the pop up CT that they do after the scalp filler. You see the thing completely like a sliver, like you showed earlier. Once it's drained, it's like back again. The whole artery is like filled up. Wow. So. We, we don't have IR people that are willing to stick things in the heart, but, <laughs> um, but we called our CT surgery colleagues to get an opinion, and um, their suggestion was that he was high risk, but that the, what they would offer would be to open the sternum and try to evacuate the hematoma. And we were concerned because of where it was, sort of intramyocardial, it would just be a mess. And so we were a little bit concerned we might be falling into this trap that it would be a be able to get the hematoma out, but the patient wouldn't, wouldn't survive that. Um, so we opted for conservative management. Um, he looked relatively stable at that point, so we did frequent ECGs. We watched gradual resolution. It took a long time for those STs to really come down. We had an art line just following if he developed a pulses. He only had about 5 millimeters or 10 millimeters maybe of pulses. And we could follow that, and it gradually got better. We got a repeat echo, but we found our best technician and got a real one the next morning. And we did a repeat CTA that at 24 hours that looked absolutely identical. Um, and so we kept watching him for about a week. He finally started feeling better and ambulating, and we discharged him to home. And I have um, just um, a couple quick comments. Let me just, I'm just going to cut to the punch here since I know we're short on time. Um, the, he actually came for follow. He didn't really want. He didn't want to come to the cath lab ever again. <laughs> <laughs> didn't want to come for a CT. We tried to talk him into a CT, but he was willing to have an echo. And uh, by one year follow up, his right ventricular function is normal, and he is no longer has a compressed right ventricle, and does not complain of any symptoms. He won't. <laughs> um, so that's. That's <laughs> awesome. <laughs> yeah, that's pretty good. Yeah.